Hello, good evening, all. Uh, Kelly, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you see me? Yes, Sorry, I can see you. I can see you. Okay, great. Good. great, great. All right, all right. Uh, so, guys, uh, welcome all to our ISOMS free live lecture on the lumbar pelvic contributors to the pelvic health uh, dysfunction. It's a case report analysis. We really thank uh, Dr. Kelly to give us this uh, lecture on such a short notice uh, and spending her valuable weekend time, morning time. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. We really appreciate that. Uh, so yeah, without further ado, do, uh, Dr. Kelly, you can start and you can have your introduction first and you can go a bit slow if you don't mind because people ha uh, like have been having a little <laughs> difficulty to understand a bit. Uh, so yeah, and I can guess the, okay. sub the subtitles are on from your end. Um, I can, are, are they showing right now? Let me see. I can, wait, wait. there, they should be on now. Yes. Very good. All right. Great. 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 Okay. Well, okay. Uh, good, good, sure. good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen and Okay, um, I, thank you for joining me. I believe it is the evening where you may be. Um, it's about eight o'clock in the morning here. I am in Texas in the United States. Um, I am a full-time clinician that works in pelvic health. I have my background in orthopedics though. And so I have substantial training in and orthopedic skills um, for, for many years, for about 15 years, and have delved into the pelvic health um, realm, which I've quite enjoyed. And hopefully today I'm going to be showing you two case studies that I have presented on um, at national conferences um, pertaining to cases that were presented with um, a umbrella term, low back pain, and had some underlying pelvic floor pathology um, and influence. And by treating some simple effective strategies um, orthopedically and through musculoskeletal approaches with some influence from pelvic floor treatments, um, it allowed me to to get the patient better. So hopefully you'll take away some golden nuggets and, um, and you can, I can learn from this talk. I am going to be in India and, in, oh, it's not, uh, next weekend, but the weekend after. So in about, in about two weeks, I'm going to be with ISOM teaching in person. You can become a pelvic health certified specialist. Um, I will be presenting a two day course in Mumbai and De New Delhi. And so I look forward to seeing you all there. I don't know if you want to add anything, Dr. Kumar. Um, yeah, it will be a great experience, guys. So uh, please do come along. It is a hands-on training by Dr. Kelly Wilson, who is a pelvic health expert. She has been practicing pelvic health uh, for like, I guess, more than a decade or more than two yes. decades. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, Dr. Kelly and myself, Dr. Parijat, we will be in India, in Delhi and Mumbai, uh, for the specific hands-on training for pelvic health, for dry needling and extremity manipulative therapist as well, which will cover shoulder as well as elbow. So you're welcome to join in. You're welcome to ask, uh, in-person hands-on training by Dr. Kelly Wilson and Dr. Parijat. Okay. So we hope to see you there. Thank you. Someone has... Um, the ability to write, but I'm going to ignore it, but I don't know if you're able to change the setting. <laughs> I'm trying to see. I'm sorry. Yeah. Wait, hold on. Uh, guys, please try to maintain the decency. Don't write anything on the presentation. I'm trying to see the... Uh, you can share the presentation, uh, Kelly. Sorry. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> So please don't try to make any drawings on the presentation, guys. We will appreciate that. Thank you. If you okay, have any so questions, I'm yeah, sorry. If you have any questions, oh, go ahead. you can put that in the chat box. The chat box is open. You're welcome to put that in the chat box if you have any questions and concerns. Okay. Thank you so much. And a little a couple more things about me. I am and now the co-host on the American Academy of Manual Physical Therapist podcast. 
you can check it out on Spotify or um, any kind of podcast link. Um, I am pro providing the pelvic health topics um, on a quarterly basis. And it's an overall great podcast to listen to about um, new research and evidence-based discussion with authors from, from all um, walks of life internationally. <clears throat> okay, so... My first case is going to be a male in his early 30s who presented with chronic low back pain that is debilitating enough to keep him from doing his normal housework and playing with his children. Um, I'm sure um, you all see so many um, general um, presentation just similar to this as well. And the way that he presented was he had um, lumbar and thoracic limitation. He had L4 myotomal weakness. He had hypermobility throughout his lumbar spine that tended to PA mobilize, boggy, and he was guarded. He was found that he was tender to palpate at the tip of his coccyx. I will reference that people with coccyx pain a lot of times aren't coming to you directly for that being their chief complaint. Um, usually, um, a tailbone injury might be something that occurred one year ago, but most likely even five, 10, 20 years ago, where the patient won't even discuss their tailbone pain with you as their primary generator for pain. They correlate it more with their low back pain because the tailbone pain may be so chronic at this point, they, and it's such a part of their life. They don't even know how to separate that and they don't necessarily find it important. You and I might feel like, geez, I would definitely know I would have pain with sitting directly on my tailbone, but the central sensitization has set on so long that it is very much brain smudging at this point and very hazy for them to verbalize point specific pain at their tailbone because it's going throughout their spine. So I just warrant that even as an orthopedic physical therapist or someone that's treating low back pain, you do want to screen coccydnia and coccyx pain and just do a quick screen of touching on the coccyx to see if there is any tenderness upon palpation there, because if there is, that is an issue and then that needs to be resolved because the coccyx is the base of our spine and that is our uh, mutated dog tail. There needs to be some mobility present at the coccyx to allow for fluid movement all the way up the chain. So moving on, he had um, tender abdominal um, region pain and he, he had a history of chronic constipation. You will find a comorbidity sometimes with coccydnia and low back pain with people having constipation. And so screening, asking about constipation <clears throat> is also important in any population. One, people don't realize that they are constipated. People, um, everyone will say, oh, I'm fine. The, the questions that you need to ask are, do you have daily bowel movements? Um, yes or no. A normal bowel movement though can be once um, every day up to once every three days. So if someone has a bowel movement once every three days, that can be within the normal realm. The follow-up question would be though, do you strain or do you have any pain with a bowel movement? Um, if they are straining every time, if they are having pain with bowel movement, that is a sign that they're having difficult bowels and that they could potentially be constipated. With that correlated abdominal tenderness too, you can pull in that picture, perhaps. Another good question would be, do you have history of hemorrhoids? Hemorrhoids can be a sign of straining, um, therefore correlated with constipation. <clears throat> the therapist palpated obturator internus, which we're going to discuss in a second. The obturator internus, we're going to discuss why that's an important muscle to screen um, with your low back patient, pain patients and specifically those with tailbone pain. Um, they had pain with um, end range, passive range of motion, internal rotation. Obturator internus is an external rotator. 
So they're going to have pain with putting it on a stretch. Perhaps it's tight, guarded, hypertonic, and they were tender to palpation. And then the hip, his hip flexion strength was severely weak and painful. This is a pelvic health special interest group decision tree that's on the AAONPT website. It's a free resource that I developed with my um, special interest group for pelvic health. Um, I can get that link to you guys. Um, but this is a resource if you are treating um, just straightforward orthopedic musculoskeletal patients in your practice and you want to give them the screening tool, this allows you to pull in um, some, some correlated symptom presentation that the pelvic floor is involved. If there is a single checked response in section one or two, you can deduce that pelvic floor dysfunction is included with their pathology. So <clears throat> additional objective findings beyond just a straightforward musculoskeletal subjective intake was chronic constipation, pain at tailbone, and severely tender to palpation with the obturator internus. <clears throat> He had previously seen a chiropractor for six weeks. Um, he had um, received treatment um, and, and p and &E, and then spine repeated lumbar extension, thoracic extension, and lumbar PAs. Um, he had received hip mobilizations and stretching and core exercises. The results were minimal improvement in pain and function, and L4 myotome strength did improve, um, but his pain and his um functional activity tolerance did not. <clears throat> so quickly, coccidinia is, um, coccyx pain syndrome is a complaint of, you know, pain at the coccyx or sacrococcygeal joint. The levator, levator ani syndrome, the levator ani muscles are part of the pelvic floor muscles. There's three muscles that make up that surround the anus, the vagina, if it's a female. <clears throat> um, they can cause episodic rectal pain um, caused by spasm of the levator anine muscle. And that can be a subset of coccidinia. Um, and to reflect upon, there is no gold standard for diagnosis of coccidinia. There is no specific measurement the tailbone should be at. We're going to show in a couple images. So here it is. <clears throat> so there's no defined um, angle. The coccyx can move exceptionally, I think about almost uh, 70 to 120 degrees from flexion to extension. So it should be pretty mobile. And in the male population, the coccyx is actually very flexed a lot more than the female population. Probably that's allowed because men aren't having babies. <clears throat> and so babies can enter, exit the um, birth canal easier without a pointy coccyx, thank goodness. Um, and then male populations also do present with deviations to the right or left more commonly without any symptom presentation. So just be aware of that as well. <clears throat> but you want to palpate until you feel the tip of the coccyx and you can palpate for lateral deviations. And, you, and you're palpating for abnormally forward fl um, flexed coccyx. <clears throat> Here's a video of me demonstrating how I like to palpate the coccyx. So um, potentially the patient, you know, you can do this with their pants on. If, if they have a really forward flexed coccyx, then perhaps not. These jeans were nice and soft, but you can see I'm taking my thumb on my palpating hand, I'm guiding it with my top hand, my right hand. I'm placing the pressure with my top thumb um, because I find when people are trying to palpate with their index finger or their, um, let me go ahead, go back to this. Um, their index finger or just one-handed palpation, um, you're gonna be very pointy and it's gonna cause them pain as well. And so I, I, I'm guiding it slowly with this top finger down and I'm walking down from the inferior aspect of the sacrum, down walking to the sacrococcygeal junction, down to finding that tip of that penis. I mean, penis, and I apologize. Tip, I teach public floor courses all the time. Tip of the coccyx. Um, so um, you want to be able to hone in on the tip of the coccyx and find that, that margin if you don't especially in the male population, you may not. 
but they should not be jumping off a table or be reporting anything greater than a two out of 10 pain upon palpation. Now, I also, you can see in this video, I'm finding the tip of the coccyx, and then I'm also pointing out there is a transverse process to the coccyx at C1. Um, and so I'm also finding in the vicinity the transverse process of the coccyx, because that will be a technique I'll show in a minute. But you can see how in close proximity, the ILA is here of the sacrum, about one finger width inferior to the ILA, which I believe you guys have learned in your ISOMP courses and your basic um, orthopedic palpation skills and in your training, one finger width down would be the vicinity of the transverse process of the coccyx. And so when I'm palpating here, I'm not necessarily feeling, I'll be honest with you, like a bony, um, hard infeel of I'm on top of the transverse process of the coccyx. I don't feel that. I am feeling for the quality of the tissue um, surrounding that region. Um, if I'm pressing on that, doing a posterior to anterior like pivot, a little spring test there, and there isn't as much give, then I can define that as a, as a hypomobile moment. Or if I feel more restriction at the tissue underneath my thumbs within that region on the left side and on the right side, my thumbs are having to go deeper until I feel that point of restriction, then I know that perhaps there's a deflection or there is like a moment of restriction in that area. Okay. <clears throat> so I just don't want you to think that I am that's good where I'm like, I know I'm on specifically the transverse process and I can feel the bone. That's not the case. You're honoring the tissue within that area and that region. <clears throat> so here's where I'm walking my pad of my thumb down until I feel the tip. See how I'm guiding and then I'm palpating along the transverse process. And I'm palpating with the flat tip of my thumb, not with the flat pad of my thumb, not the tip of my thumb as well. That's more comforting to the patient and increases the surface area. So you can do a coccyx sprain test on the right and left transverse process of the coccyx. Um, what we just discussed that um, one finger width inferior to the inferior lateral angle of the sacrum would be the transverse process. And like I said earlier, you're assessing for points of hypomobility or restriction. You can do this in prone. You can do this in quadruped. You can have them go into a cat camel in quadruped. You can have them move their lower extremities sliding their knees forward and back in quadruped while you're doing a PIVM PA mobilization on that coccyx and feeling for any restriction. You can progress them into a seated position, posterior, and, and having them go into a posterior and anterior pelvic tilt while they're seated and marching. It's important to get them to where, what's the most aggravating for them functionally, correct? So if they are coming to you, let's say as a patient sitting and they're leaning forward because they cannot sit up, they can't go into a posterior pelvic tilt and seat it at all because that loads the coccyx too much because the coccyx is a tripod between the two sit bones. Um, we need to get them back to tolerating a posterior pelvic tilt so that's why this technique can be progressed into the seated position and going directly into their um, intolerance to what um, functional position they need to be in. Um, so hold on, I just wanted to see. Okay, so let me go back. I wanna give you guys one thing from here. This is my forward flexed coccyx muscle energy technique. And so this is a real easy technique externally that you can do on the patient. Let's say the patient palpated with a forward flex coccyx. So you're going to do a muscle energy technique. And what you're going to do is you're going to resist hip external rotation. So we're trying to gradually resist minutely a graded resistance to uptick the obturator internus, which shares fascial components as well, 
with the coccyx. So obturator interna shares fascial components with the levator ani. We're going to discuss in a second. And so that's why this can be effective with helping pull the coccyx more superficially or more, more posteriorly. So see, I have my hand, I'm resisting her inside medial malleolus. And, and so I'm, but I'm making sure I'm not upticking it. This one thing that students say, they are like, this didn't help me at all with coccyx pain. You've got to make sure you're not being too strong in your resistance with the patient. It needs to be very mild. You can see her butt cheek, her glutes are not um, contracting or upticking through her jeans. As I do that, you want to make sure that you're feeling only the deep hip external rotators turning on to resist that resist this resistance. I go through that three times and I do a pre and post test with my tailbone patients. Meaning I assess what tenderness their pain is at the beginning of the treatment, like on a scale from zero to 10, what's your pain at the tip of your tailbone or at the sacrococcygeal junction. I do this technique three times. I reassess what's your pain on a scale from zero to 10. As we discussed earlier, remember patients with coccidinia have brain smudging. They have no way to, to, to tell you if it feels better or not. Because if you ask the patient, if you reassess after you do that and you say, how does that feel? They're going to say, it still hurts. You're going to get that answer every time. So this is one of the things, one body part that I am very specific where I want them to give me an acute report of what their presentation is. So I get a post assessment on a scale from zero to 10. What's your pain now? Okay. It's a five. The first time it was a seven. I'm going to now repeat that technique again, three more times. This sometimes if you do have an acute or tailbone forward flex coccyx, and it's just straightforward. They fell on their butt or who knows what happened. They were really constipated and strained really hard to have a bowel movement. You, you repeat this three more times. I recheck what's your pain now. Oh, it went from a five to a three. We're going to repeat that again. We're going to repeat that three more times. Great. Recheck. I have had patients go from a nine out of 10 to a zero out of 10, just by doing this technique alone. Um, that's awesome. They've been having pain for 20 years to that region and did not know that. So you just keep on trucking and you keep on doing this technique until you, it plateaus. If it plateaus out at a three out of 10 pain at a five out of 10, 10 pain, then you need to go in and find out what else is going on. Is the coccyx deviated? Um, <clears throat> you know, is there something more going on to the region? Um, so with this with the spring test, yes. So this, I wanted to relay with you guys. I wanted to give you one skill. That's my MET for this case, um, or a couple of skills. Within the in-person course, I go through um, my breakdown of my very involved coccyx treatment with my patients um, and everything that I do with my patients, my algorithm for getting them better, my manual skills. So that will be taught in the in-person course um, in a couple of weeks. Also considerations that you need to do for coccidinia is um, pelvic floor treatment. We don't want to be giving a Kegel to a patient that has a forward flex coccyx. You need to understand the difference between um, a concentric contraction and an, an eccentric contraction of the pelvic floor muscles, because we would want to provide a lengthening exercise to the pelvic floor muscles. Um, and I'm going to show that in the next case study. You can do yoga poses, happy baby stretch helps with lengthening the pelvic floor muscles. Um, and then we want to bring back in Kegels coordinated with breathing. That's part of your high level clinical reasoning. We want to provide lengthening and then we want to pull back strengthening, but understanding when to do that is appropriate. And that comes with the training as well. Um, if you have dry needling, we're doing a dry needling course as well. You can easily um, have an adjunct therapy of dry needling to all these different parts of the body part to help with 
um, the coccyx pain and low back pain. Um, then giving pelvic tilts and quadruped, lumbopelvic stability and re-education. And then, you know, if they really need a wedge, I stay away from donut cushions now, but wedge, wedge cushions, gel cushions, NSAIDs, um, if you have injections around your area. Um, and then there's other possible treatments until rectal soft tissue massage, inter rectal coccyx mobilization. We are going to be teaching internal rectal mobilizations in the in-person pelvic health certification course. So you can learn rectal palpation and how to manipulate the coccyx and also external soft tissue massage. Uh, Here's some stretches that you can do. We talked about quadruped and um, child's pose, deep seated squat. These are all ways to lengthen the pelvic floor muscles. For the obturator internus, now this muscle is very interesting because it has direct tied in fascial components um, and it also direct bony attachment into the pelvis, fascial components that also go all the way up through the body um, and shares a strong fascial connection with the levator ani. So the muscle here on the right is the obturator internus, and it sits in this bowl. It spans this picture. I feel like doesn't do it quite as much justice because it does span on my skeleton here. Obturator internus, we forget, spans pretty um, anterior along to the pubic symphysis. It, it sits inside this fossa. Um, and so it can be a site and a source for um, hip pathology and hip pain as well. Um, so, so, but because of its shared fascial connection with the levator ani and its overlay, it can definitely have some synonymous crosstalk with the pelvic floor and with visceral components. Um, so the pelvic, the obturator internus is an important stabilizer, you know, and a primary mover for hip external rotation, but it can also, it, 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 it needs to have a semiotic relationship with the pelvic floor muscles to assist with overcoming the forces that are coming down from above, like intra-abdominal pressure. Also, it's a big stabilizer for helping maintain continence. Um, so we know what the functional role for the obturator internus is, um, but it's the first muscle to activate with hip external rotation and hip abduction. And it's a state, it has a stabilizing role similar to the multifidi in the spine. So there has been studies like Tuttle in 2014 showed that strengthening the dip, deep hip rotators, including the obturator internus, improved pelvic floor muscle strength. So when you guys are doing you know, hip abduction, strengthening, um, side steps with resistance bands, um, clamshells, um, uh, pretzel exercise. When you're doing these things, you are actually helping potentially the pelvic floor muscles. Some patients in my clinic that are just truly weak, very weak, you know, maybe they're elderly or they had a fall or they had some kind of surgery recovery. They are come to me with leakage, stress incontinence, well, truly they need to be gaining more strength to their deep hip external rotators. And that ends up helping resolve their stress incontinence. So I don't think that people realize how much over cross they are doing within the clinic. So you might be having some efficacy and improvement of your patients and not even knowing it. Um, so let me, okay. They found the muscles, as we know, muscles can be lax. They can be overactive. Sorry, Kelly, can you share the presentation again? I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, so the obturator internus, they have found... The mu okay, as we know, muscles can be overactive, they can be underactive, they can be working appropriately, or um, they're they're late to the race, right? They they become less active. Um, the pelvic floor muscles can, like from being overactive and tight and guarded, can induce the obturator internus to be insufficient or weak. Um, hip pain with palpable tenderness to the obturator internus 
So if there's hip pain presentation and they have tenderness to the obturator internus, we need to be assessing the pelvic floor muscles. That will be what we'll be discussing in a couple of weeks. How do you palpate the, the pelvic floor muscles? One thing that's great about my courses is whether you're like, I never would do an internal examination. I would, I don't want to go there. If you are an orthopedic um, therapist, um, one of my mantras is you need to have a baseline understanding of the pelvic floor muscles and understanding how to palpate even externally to get an assessment of what those muscles are doing. Because if you find that you're a comprehensive therapist and covering your ground with low back pain patients, hip pain patients, and you're missing that big, pus- big puzzle of those pelvic floor muscles, you're missing the, you're, you're missing it completely. Um, so, so the course will offer many strategies for external assessment and understanding. Um, and then as well as an added option for internal palpation to provide public floor examinations. And we'll have more details on that, um, on the website. Um, but here's a quick way to do assessment of the obturator internus and sideline. Now, remember the obturator internus, you're going to be palpating medial to the ischial tuberosity. Um, so the ischial tuberosity is here. You're going to be dropping your fingers medial, but if you're directly, your hand placement is straight superior. I mean, yeah, inferior to superior. You're going to be on the levator ani. If you deflect your hand palpation 45 degrees towards the ischial tuberosity, then you'll be on the obturator internus. So what this, this therapist did in this picture is she has the patient in sideline. She's palpating the downside on, so the patient's right side, right obturator internus. She oriented to find the ischial tuberosity. She slid her fingers, keeping her, her hands and her fingers straight. She slid into a inferior to superior position and deflected her elbow as her picture is her elbow is going 45 degrees up towards the ceiling. So she's hooking in and down into the table to make sure to be on the obturator internus. One way that she's ensuring that she's on that correct muscle is she asks the patient to push the knee into the table. So she's kicking on external rotation. That muscle belly should pop out at her fingers. So that's one great way to find it, to ensure that you're actually on the obturator internus is to get the, to resist hip external rotation and abduction. Um, so that, that's a great way to assess if there is um, tenderness upon palpation there. You can also turn this into a treatment. It can be a trigger point release. So you can have the patient breathe through as if there is tenderness there, apply a graded um, application of palpation and pressure, have the patient breathe a couple of breaths through, see if you can get that muscle to release um, and reassess again, how's the tenderness now? So this is a great way to do an easy um, muscle release um, to particularly this muscle. Obturator internus, as a side note, gives a referral pain pattern directly to the rectum tailbone area. It will feel like golf ball, a golf ball size pain around that region. And so if the patient does report, they have a golf ball feeling pain at their tailbone, you need to assess the obturator internus and potentially do this technique and release to the muscle. So the patient ended up, um, you know, had some leakage that increased um, initially um, before improving. So sometimes that can happen. They can have symptom uptick um, the first week or two, and then symptoms start re- uh, resolving. He was able to take less pain medication. Um, whenever treating the obturator internus, um, it immediately improved the symptoms with lumbar PAs and hip passive range of motion. So they already had increased mobility and pain and movement at their lumbar just by doing that treatment on the obturator internus. Um, He had increased riding a bicycle for exercise and walking almost a mile. Um, In summary, the specific treatment that is provided will be different depending on practitioner, personal um, equipose, and personal scope of practice. The key is to appreciate when there is tailbone pain and that the pelvic floor muscles can affect coccyx pain, pain, low back pain, 
and hip pain. Um, so hopefully you can take away um, a couple of skills from this, um, this case study. I found that very interesting. We're actually publishing this case series in the Journal of Pelvic Health that should be coming out this year um, for these, these case presentations. So that's real exciting to get published. Um, okay, so does anyone have any questions about that last case? I'll take a couple right now before we jump into the next case. Guys, if you have any questions regarding the case, please, you can let us know. Uh, Kelly, I'll let you know. Uh, I guess uh, okay. th there was a question uh, a gentleman wanted to ask that if, uh, is there any advice for a patient who's unable to lie down straight for more than five minutes and sits up in the bed whole night? She says she's having pain for the left hip one and pain in the right leg over the quadriceps and under the knee, post-total knee replacement. I don't know. I mean, is, is it related to this case? <laughs> That's like quite a long question. Yeah. Um, I mean, if someone can't lie down, sometimes I I'm not pertaining, I'm answering it specifically to this patient, but if someone doesn't tolerate laying down um, on their back, um, I mean, then maybe you have to start with, and they can only sit up, then you're going to start with maybe the mobilization in the seated position. Um, but uh, I mean, I try to get them with pillows if they can tolerate laying on their stomach, at least at first, I know it can be painful. I don't know how large they are, um, but get them propped up on pillows and do the best that I can. Um, they, yeah, that's a difficult, difficult one. <laughs> All right. No, no problem. That was great. And Dr. Kelly, do you mind showing the OI palpation on the skeletal model again, please? Um, yes. OI. So the, oh, right here. So the OI, the obturator internus. So let's just say a patient is um, lying on their back supine um, and that you are inferior to them with your hand and you have their knees bent. So this is another way to get to the obturator internus. If you take your palpating hand, you find the ischial tuberosity and you, you're you going through the meaty aspect of their gluteal region. So you're going to go ahead and go straight um, cephalid. So you're going to go straight up to their head and palpate to get to the obturator internus, you're going to move your, the pad of your fingers towards the ischial tuberosity and be medial to that. So you're going to be at a 45 degree angle, um, going towards their right hip. And what you do is you can have with your non palpating hand resist their knee hip ab knee abduction. So have them push their knee out and you'll feel the muscle belly pull up into their fingers. If you're not, if you don't feel the muscle belly, you know, popping out at your fingertips, then perhaps you're on the levator ani. You could have the patient do a Kegel or try to squeeze or hold back a toot, and you might feel the muscle belly, you know, pop out of your finger. That that way, you know, you're on the pelvic floor muscles. Deflect your fingers 45 degrees over laterally, and then you would be on the obturator internus. Okay. Yep. Great. Uh, I see a lot of people asking questions about coccidemia, the precautions, the partial connections. Guys, if you want to have all these questions answered, it will be answered better in person in the hands-on training when Dr. Kelly is doing her pelvic health course, because I guess we will be doing the coccidemia assessment and the treatment as well uh, in our hands-on training. Okay. So please, you're welcome to see the details of our pelvic health course where Dr. Kelly would be coming. All right. Uh, Dr. Kelly, when you're sharing the presentation next and right now, you're, we're discussing the case study too. Do you mind there's a drop down bar on the top, which says annotate. Can you undo that annotate thing? Now you can share the presentation. Oh, wait, wait. Um, I, yeah. I don't see the annotate though. No, no. Share the screen now. First share the screen. Okay. All right. Gotcha. So when you share the screen, there's a drop down mm -hmm. bar on the top and there will be a pen mark which says annotate. Just share the screen first. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I was looking. Okay. Yeah. Now see oh, the, annotate. Yeah. yeah, just undo that because I'm sure they are great cartoonists in our parts. <laughs> just uncheck the annotate. Oh, okay. I... There's not like, like there's a pen, there's a drop down bar and there's a pen mark. Yeah, I see the annotate, but like yeah. I'm trying to get where uncheck it. There's not a check option. I apologize. Is, is um, there a drop down uh, near the annotate? 
No, I just have different options of uh, mouse, select, text, draw. Can you try I'm clicking to... annotate? Can you try clicking annotate? Yeah. Oh, see. And then I'm trying to get it where they can't draw, but. Yep. Guys, please maintain the decorum. Please try not to create any drawings on the presentation. Respect the time and the hard work. So please don't do that. Um, it's not letting me uncheck it, but I can um, I can clear as needed. So, okay. Uh, oh. All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Uh, okay. That's okay. Guys, yeah, guys, please try not to uh, draw anything on the presentation. All right. So yeah. Okay. And, uh, so this is. Kelly, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. And this one of our Canadian uh, participant, he wants to know: Can dry needling help with the OI dysfunction of the pelvic floor? Yes. Yes, um, you can dry needle the the obturator and the obturator. Did he say obturator internus? Yeah. Yes. Yes, please. Yes. 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 You can draw. You can you can dry needle the obturator internus very successfully to help with um, overflow to the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. You can go. Thank yeah. Okay. So. Um, let's see. So. So. So my patient. This is this is my patient, and he was a 38 year old male. And this is what I because I'm a pelvic floor therapist. Um. This is what. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me share the share the screen. Okay. Because I'm a pelvic floor therapist, I now get di diagnoses on the pad from the physician saying you know, urinary frequency, erectile dysfunction, urgency, incontinence. These are things that, um, that I will explain in the pelvic floor course a little bit today, but so he was having, you know, in 2018, he had a kidney stone episode, um, you know, three years in a row and that resulted in him having kidney issues and making him want to urinate and have more frequency with urination throughout the day. He also said he had erectile dysfunction, um, especially when his urgency was really bad. Um, now he didn't have, he had the ability to become erect, but he had reduced endurance, especially when he had pain and he had some difficulty with ejaculation sometimes. Um, urgency with urination, he was unable to hold it longer than five minutes when the urge comes on, but he denied any leakage with urgency. With the male population, usually you don't see um, you don't see a ton of leakage usually happening with them, like the case with females. Um, but they do have some dribbling issues after they get off the toilet, perhaps. Um, but he did have a little bit of pea size leakage with coughing, but that was very rare with him. He said just every once in a while. So here's my decision tree again that will um, send the link out for the free resource on the AOMT website. Um, and these were all the things that he included with his history. So he had all these issues. Um, here's a great picture of the male pelvic floor muscles. So the pelvic floor runs directly and supports the prostate, supports the bladder, surrounds the rectum, and it goes from the pubic bone to the tailbone um, and the urethra runs directly through that. Um, and so it's, it's just as support, supportive as it is in the female population. Um, but men have a propensity of having the pelvic floor muscles not necessarily become lax and weak, but become very overactive and over-engaged. Men have a propensity of carrying tension, stress, tone, there's a very high, high, um, um, relationship with, um, anxiety, um, and the sympathetic nervous system and those fibers that go down into the visceral organs and the pelvic floor that really give a lot of crosstalk and convergence inducing pelvic floor muscle tightness. Um, and so it's a very common feature in the male population particularly the younger population, 50 and below. So back to our patient, he fell off of a wall um, 10 years ago, or in, in he, about, about 10 years ago, and he had had surgery in 2020, um, L4, L5, S1, where vertebral spacers were, um, were placed. He also had confirmed MRI um, um, study with right labral tear, 
and he had snapping hip syndrome that started after fall off wall. So he had low back involvement pain and hip pain when he came to me. So what are we supposed to do now? This is a very involved case with an active duty soldier. He's young. He's got all these urinary, you know, (laughs) um, sexual dysfunction, also back pain, hip pain can be very scary or kind of daunting um, as a new therapist or, you know, someone, especially even if you're just orthopedic with those sexual and urinary involvement as well. Um, So this case is going to show how you can do some simple things um, to get them in a more directed, um, better path. Um, So for my objective findings, I found that he had poor differentiation of his pelvic floor muscles. He was unable to do a strong and stable concentric contraction or active relaxation. He had increased compensation strategies of his adductors and abdominal muscles. So sometimes you try to recruit your outside tummy muscles like the rectus abdominis um, to help with that. And all that does to help contract your pelvic floor muscles, but all that does is bear down and cause a compromise to the pelvic floor below, um, making it bear down and making it lose its control and ability to stabilize and hold those organs. He had moderate tenderness palpated along the medial gluteal region. So I think this is a video. So this is a female, obviously, but this is, you could have, I have all my male patients lay like this in the hook line supine position. And it's pretty easy because they can stay clothed. If they, if I want them to stay clothed, I can do a pincer grip palpation with my hands and, and, and feel right where those pink stickers are on the patient. Um, and the feel that the pelvic floor muscles are contracting or relaxing with this patient. You can see she's, she's turning on her butt muscles. She's gluteal compensating here. She's pulling in with her adductors a little bit as well. Um, and so this is abnormal recruitment when I'm trying to get her to fire her pelvic floor muscles. Um, I should be only seeing this orange dot moving superior and perhaps these pink stickers moving medially towards the perineal region. The, the perineum is right here. So these stickers, pink stickers should be moving closer together. The orange sticker should be moving superior if it was a true isolated Kegel but it's not, she's pulling out everything, but her pelvic floor muscles. Um, and so that's one thing we'll be discussing in the course as well, how to isolate and get the patient to only activate the pelvic floor muscles. Um, what muscles need to be firing when the pelvic floor muscles are engaging, which would be the transverse abdominis. It's a needed, um, contraction that needs to happen with the pelvic floor muscles, but not your outside belly muscles. <clears throat> so with that, we would be going over that in the, the course certification as well. The patient also had limited limitation in his back. Also upon pelvic assess- analysis, um, supine and standing, he had a large superior left iliac crest, um, ASIS, PSIS, and ischial tuberosity. Looking here, you can see just him laying down his left leg and even standing. I was, I asked him when he walked in and when he sat down, I'm like, is your left leg longer? And he was like, no, it's not. A lot of times people don't even, you know, they've gone through the reiner, but no one's caught that, that, that leg length discrepancy. Here's him walking. You can see him vaulting over his left leg. He's just vaulting, vaulting, jamming, jamming his, he actually had the labral tear on his right side, but the force vector of dropping down to that right hip was problematic for him. So for the first seven treatments with the sky, um, he had urgency was 100% resolved. Erectile dysfunction was 90% back to baseline. Stress incontinence was 100% resolved. And I want you to think about what form of therapy was most effective for him, for this patient. Do you think it was pelvic floor therapy or um, orthopedic manual therapy, or was it both? I would like to say I did it all by myself, but what's pretty cool about this case study is that I actually had to go have surgery and I was gone for um, three weeks. So I missed 
seeing this patient personally. It was my friend, Dr. Reggie, that I believe has taught for ISOMPT as well. He took over the care of this patient um, for me. And all I was able to do was like a three minute flyby treatment on one particular exercise as far as pelvic floor. Reg did everything else as far as treatment for him. And what he did was he put them, put him in a heel lift. He actually, this, this gentleman had um, like a two centimeter leg length discrepancy on the left side. And so he needed to get a prescription for specialized shoes. He's active duty soldier to get in, you know, put in his boot because that's a greater than a one centimeter. So he needed to add an extra layer on his shoe, but you can easily just take some rubber and put, you know, measure out two centimeters, um, if, if need be, but we've had him starting to walk with a heel lift, um, looked closely at his, an, analyzed his muscle activation and coordination of his hip muscles, analyzed compensation strategies with gait and transitional movements. He had been walking so long all of his life with this leg length discrepancy. He needed work and neuromuscular reeducation in a mirror to see how to normalize his gait and his muscle activation. Um, Reg worked on improving strength to weaken muscles and then applied appropriate manual therapy skills. So here's some simple, straightforward hip inferior gliding, hip lateral distraction. So we mobilize the hip. We did long axis distraction manipulation to his hip to get normalized um, separation of the femoral head to the acetabulum to allow um, offloading neuromodulation and reset off of the labral and then the, the cap hip capsule innervators and pain receptors. Um, and then he had a right out flare or external rotation of his iliac crest. So this I'm doing a sustained mobilization to help with decreased um, out flare on that right side. You can think of the right side, if he's kicking his toes out, trying to elongate that right leg, his pelvic bone um, compensated. And then what's that do? It essentially shuts down the gluteal medius muscle because it puts it on too shortened of a state back here. It can't potentially, um, it can't turn on and be productive like it should be because the pelvis is too butterfly weaned externally outward. So we want to work on sustained, uh, you know, getting him more into that in flare position. And then ultimately we want to work on following up with stabilization of the muscles within that region. You can bet, bet, be sure that that right iliopsoas was not able to turn on optimally if the anominate is externally rotated or like, this on the skeleton, if this is deflected out, right? So this is gonna jam the femur forward anteriorly. It's gonna shut down the psoas or potentially the psoas is overworking because it's freaking out because it's being pushed and lengthened so much that it essentially either, it could be in a state of overactive um, and, and, and tightening and guarding, or the patient might get to you in a certain state where the psoas has finally, the iliopsoas has just shut down and it can't do anymore. So you have to figure out, you know, in what region, in what time frame that's happening. Um, because the muscle isn't always guarded and tight necessarily. It's actually deactivated and being lengthened too much. That's a whole other topic though. And I know um, this is covered in the ISOMP coursework. So my treatment for this patient was a 10 minute pelvic floor treatment within an orthopedic treatment. So I have a long wait in my clinic and I could only see him really quickly. But what I gave him was an active relaxation contraction, which I title the pelvic floor drop. It's an essentially a reverse Kegel exercise or an eccentric contraction of the pelvic floor muscles. So we know that the pelvic floor muscle contraction is, is a concentric contraction. It's squeezing and lifting superiorly. I think of the pelvic floor muscles being on an elevator. We live, we live on the ground floor. A Kegel is going up to the second to the fifth floor. And then there's a pelvic floor drop. 
which is a lengthening eccentric contraction. It happens when right before we have a bowel movement, you have to be able to lengthen and elongate these muscles to let bowel empty out. And this is going into the basement. We functionally live not in Kegel world. We actually, when we're breathing, we live in ground floor to basement, ground floor to basement. Um, that's why sometimes giving patients Kegels is, is counterintuitive. We need them to live in the ground floor to basement region instead of just constantly trying to guard and lift and lift and squeeze and squeeze if they're already in high tone. We break this down in the course um, and make it really functional for you guys to see how a patient would do better, perhaps in an anterior pelvic tilt and standing, um, getting their center of gravity more forward and getting more isolation to the pelvic floor muscles that allows them to be more mobile and show you how to palpate the patient um, to ensure that they are having proper motility to that region, but that's a needed for hands-on training. This is a, a video of an eccentric contraction of the pelvic floor. It's a, so here she is, see that orange button is dropping down towards us. Her, the pink, the pink stickers signify her ischial tuberosity. They are separating mildly. So there she went and she's lifting up. So she's lengthening right there. She's letting go and it's naturally tonically pulling back up to the ground floor. There it's dropping to the basement. She lets go. It comes back up tonically naturally to the ground floor. We could also say she takes a deep breath in and then she's exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. Many times when we see patients that have frozen TL junction, thoracic lumbar, lower rib motility, they're not breathing properly, dry diaphragmatically, they're frozen. They've got their, they live in a sagittal plane. They're not like, they don't have any movement. <laughs> um, their pelvic floor muscles essentially freeze because they're not getting that movement from above from the diaphragm. Um, and so sometimes patients just stop moving naturally with their breath on their pelvic floor muscles. And that's kind of a canary in the cave issue. It becomes a bigger problem and escalates further because those muscles aren't getting the blood flow that they need, the oxygen that they need. Um, but some cues you can give the patient is gently pushing out the pelvic floor, like you're initiating the flow of urine, passing gas. I do say, uh, try to stay away from the word push because if you tell someone push gently, they might try to bear down. And um, a valsalva contraction actually reflexively contracts the pelvic floor muscles or should. So that could be not as effective for you just to say. So I might say, um, feel like your tailbone's gently moving down to the, to the table, or, um, I want you to relax the inside of your butt cheeks, or I want you to gently release a small toot. Um, they can do this and perform this exercise daily for relaxation, pain reduction prior to intercourse and dilators. Um, and I prescribe this many times. The patient will do this two times every waking two hours. So here's um, one of the ways you can palpate the pelvic floor muscles and sidelines. See my top hands finding the ischial tuberosity. Here's what we were discussing earlier. So I'm my hand, my palm is facing the ischial tuberosity. I'm medial to that. I'm using hooking in at a pretty strong strength <laughs> to get past the, the fascia. So there's the tailbone. And then I can get her to squeeze and do a Kegel under my fingertips to feel for the pelvic floor muscles contracting. We will go over how to palpate the pelvic floor muscles and sideline prone, um, standing and um, supine. 
So here's just a quick breakdown of like understanding, you know, when muscles are being pelvic floor muscles are, are tight, overactive versus muscles that are just weak and lax. And, and what we're, we're prescribing as far as our exercise prescription for our patients, this is, we're going to break down all these diagnoses in the course, but like somebody with pain, with inability to, to empty their bladder, with pain, with urination, pain, with const, with bowel movements, um, constipation, straining, that would be a sign of the muscles being over-engaged versus symptoms with muscle weakness laxity, like they're just leaking all the time. They feel heaviness in their pelvis. Um, sometimes too, they can have difficulty emptying the bladder and bowels and have constipation because it's just too lax there. But with tension, we want to be get providing manual therapy, stretches, dilator program, relaxation techniques. We want with laxity, we want to strengthen, we want endurance training and coordination. <clears throat> and then coordination would also be with tension as well. Um, and then of course, we're looking at the body at the chain of body mechanics, alignment, correction, postural correction, and lumbo pelvic stabilization. So for my 10 minute treatment within a treatment, I gave him the pelvic floor drop and that appeared to help with him just getting his brain connected with what's happening down there to release any kind of tension in his pelvic floor or natural holding pattern or guarding. <clears throat> what about his hip, right? He had that labral tear in his hip. He had range of motion, um, reduction, um, um, going on. So we had a scour test, a positive faders. Um, he also had, this is an example of like a hip with normal hip end range. So I can spring that hip. So I'm doing a little spring test at the end and filling for his hip end range. I'm also looking for the patient to see with passive hip internal rotation, is this femur gliding up into my right hand? So let me show you again. This is, you see this person, it's got a nice spring. And I'm also making sure that the femur is not gliding superiorly as I'm placing him into internal rotation. <clears throat> Why is the spring important to me? It's not a validated test by any, main, any means, but it tells me a lot in the pelvic floor world because if there is a bony end feel pain with that end range spring, that's telling me that <clears throat> there's something not sitting right within the ball and, the, and within the capsule. So the, the ball could be sitting a little bit too superior or adhesed to the capsule. There's a moment of hypomobility going on. So here, see how there's just not enough spring going on on that right hip. Also the femur to get that internal rotation, I call it riding high. So the, the ball is, is sliding superiorly as I'm internally rotating her or him. That's an issue. We need to, the, that means that the femur, the head of the femur is not sitting in the socket properly and gliding anteriorly. We want to increase posterior hip capsule mobility so that the ball, it can move and roll within that region and not be sliding all over the place. And we talked about in the last case, why that would be a problem. If the ball is moving excessively, it's going to cause strain and issues to the obturator internus. And we know that obturator internus has indirect um, activation to the pelvic floor muscles. Um, and then they're going to also, it's going to make them gain more compensatory movement strategies due to this structural ab abnormality or compensation of the joint and the muscles. So what happens with that, that femoral head is gliding too far anteriorly or it has movement compromise in the capsule, you're gonna have increased activity of the adductors, rectus femoris, tensor fascia lata, and the uteral and the same side pelvic floor muscles. They're gonna have reduced activation and shutting down of the iliopsoas, the hip external rotators and posterior chain. So we can look at functional movement assessment of the hip. I look at straight leg raises, lawn art quads, heel slides, squatting, sit to stands. So all your bread and butter stuff you use in the clinic 
that you're treating your patients now, I'm going to be very specific and keep my eye and looking and seeing what's happening at their thigh crease. Feel for how the muscles are activating. Um, and so this is um, some of the skills that you'll learn in your ISOM course curriculum as well. But have a little bit more discerning eye with what's going on with and thinking about what's happening at the pelvic floor. Anything medially to the ischial tuberosity is going to be affected as well, not just those outside large muscles in the upper leg. So for this case study, he had all resolved his pelvic floor dysfunction by utilizing orthopedic approaches. So it was a very complex case treated with simple pelvic floor strategies and OMPT and returned him to functional activities with reduced pain and resolved pelvic floor dysfunction. So you can be very effective <laughs> um, with a complex case um, and hopefully gain confidence. Um, so in our in-person pelvic floor course, you become a certified pelvic health specialist, more in-depth explanation of the lumbo-pelvic complex, practice external palpation of the pelvic floor muscles, learn how to prescribe appropriate ex exercise prescription, combine orthopedic exercises with pelvic floor considerations throughout the whole body, covers coccyx manipulation, fascial treatment and muscle treatment surrounding the pelvis region, added opportunity to learn internal examination of the muscles. You'll learn common urinary, bowel, and sexual dysfunction diagnoses, Pro be provided an algorithmic framework on how to treat. All treatments will be clinically applicable and adaptable and can be utilized next day in the clinic. I try to use straightforward, easy approaches so you can have confidence. And you will be sought out in your community as the pelvic health expert. That once the discussion starts, it doesn't stop, you know, you guys. Um, once, once the community finds out that you can help with these things, then it becomes word of mouth and it can really help elevate your practice and your business. So thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, I will I'll take in a few questions and then... We will have the rest of our evening and day. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Kelly. Uh, that was a great presentation, great case studies. Uh, sorry for the disturbance. I'm outside, guys, uh, at the airport. Uh, that was <laughs> quite a good uh, elaborate explanation about the pelvic health, the bowel, the hip, how they all can be interconnected, guys. You guys had great questions about the obturator internus and the fascial connection with the pelvic floor. Uh, somebody has about the Kegel because I know a lot of people have uh, like misunderstanding about whether to do the Kegels or whether to relax the pelvic floor. These are great questions, guys. And believe me, all these questions will be answered in person in the hands-on training. Okay. Uh, there's a question, Dr. Kelly, where a person wants to know that, uh, why does the female, uh, have more passing of urine in urge incontinence, incontinency than in males? Oh, well, for one, the hole's a little bit bigger. <laughs> I mean, well, so women are more susceptible to stress incontinence, um, not so much urge incontinence. So stress incontinence, meaning leakage with laughing, sneezing, jumping. Um, I think it's just because the proximity of where the bladder is so closely to the urethral opening um, anatomically. So um, it gets more susceptible to the pressures. Men, their sphincter is a little bit, you know, they have that exit point of the pubic bone, but the penis is traveling down. So, um, and you also have the prostate to separate. So I think it's an anatomical variance. Um, women gravitational pull ends up compromising and kinking the urethra more, um, making it more susceptible. Also, I will say our urethral opening in females becomes very, um, a huge victim to hormonal changes. So if you think about a woman that has, um, as going through menopause or aging and has a drop in hormones, um, that area, I call it a garden, like it needs to be moist. It needs to be supported. Um, but with hormones feed that garden. So if there's, when there's a drop in hormones, that garden becomes dry. The only thing left really everything around it shrinks. 
The only thing left is the urethra, which is static. So the urethra actually becomes larger because everything else around it is shrinking and that compromises it and causes it more susceptible to leakage as well. Great. Yep. So uh, somebody asked me, I mean, I answered that person that whether how the pelvic obliquity like interior nominate or posterior nominate rotation or the upslip or the downslip can affect the stability of the pelvic floor muscles. I have answered that. Yes, uh, they can in a way uh, also depends upon the kind like different other social fa other factors like the body weight, uh, the, the fitness level, the body types. Uh, they all can play a big major role in the pelvic floor stability. And Dr. Kelly is a better person to answer that. But yes, guys, uh, I will let Dr. Kelly go for to now. It was great presentation by her on a Sunday morning. We really thank Dr. Kelly and we can't wait uh, for her to see in person in Delhi and Mumbai for a two day pelvic health certification course. And uh, you get a certificate of certified pelvic health therapist. All right. We also have dry needling. So there will be basic and advanced dry needling done by myself, Dr. Parijat Kumar and Dr. Kelly Wilson. We are doing it in Mumbai and in Delhi, in India. And we also have an extremity manipulation therapist uh, in person hands on training. So this is a total of like five to 10 days of hands on training. You're welcome to select all the triple certification. You're welcome to select one certification, but I would really appreciate if the male or the female physios can look into signing up for the pelvic health because this is a lifetime opportunity guys dr kelly wilson she uh, was the president of the pelvic health section she is there in the aom she's writing papers so you will not get this opportunity uh, again and again to do pelvic health from dr kelly wilson itself okay so please if you have any question and concerns you are welcome to approach us we will also have dry needling by myself and uh, dr kelly and extremity manipulated therapist, I, we would be covering shoulder, elbow, and basic and advanced foundation. All right, Dr. Kelly, you can have a last word and then we will see you in person. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that, that's great. And to follow up, yes, I do check pelvic obliquity in my pelvic floor patients. Huge, huge presence with that. So um, I'll tie that all in with the courses, but thank you so much. And I hope to see everyone there. I'm really excited to come and 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 to teach and and to learn i always learn from from you too <laughs> so we, thank you very much sure thank you so much dr kelly thank you all for your patience and signing in to learn on a sunday evening you have a good day good night and bless you all thank you so much Do thank you dr kelly thank you take care thank bye, -bye. You.